four. And uh, I thought I would get through this whole chapter tonight, but no. But then again, we don't really have we don't really have to rush, do we? Amen. We got to Jesus come. You know, after Jesus comes, we still be learning. Amen. Praise God. It don't stop here. We'll still be learning in the ages to come. Um, get an insight to just what God did in sending his son Jesus. And um, I think it'll just be an amazing time for us all. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, as we approach you tonight, we thank you, Lord, for your word. Your Lord, your words are life. They are help to our flesh. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name, for the Holy Spirit, our teacher. And we pray tonight, God, that you would instruct us by your word not just in our hearing, but the application as well. So God, as we open your word tonight, speak distinctly to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians chapter 4, we'll probably go to about verse 11 um, on tonight. Now, um, in studying in this book, I found that some actually call Galatians a mini Romans. And the book Galatia, Galatians, we found out, is really key and um, fueling the Protestant Reformation, uh, key scripture being the just shall live by faith. And, um, you know, so this book, even though it's small, has really um, impacted our culture. Um, you know, it's one of those books that each time you read it, like all the writings in, in the Bible, actually, the more you read them, the more you'll get insight and understanding in them. Uh, one of the things in Galatians is liberty, liberty in the spirit. We'll see, see that coming up a little later, but Paul is primarily making contrast in these first four chapters um, with this issue concerning law and grace. Too often when people are, are law or works mandate, they feel like it's what they do to get right with God. And, and when, I'm, when we're under grace, it's not what we do, it's what Christ did for us. Huge distinction there. And then again, when it comes to those particular areas, um, the church here is struggling. They're having an issue, you know, with making that transition. So this is a transitional type book. He's writing to people who had been uh, growing up in a mindset of being under the law. And now they are saved. And it's primarily a Gentile church. But then you have Jews who come in who are beginning to sow among them. They are believers. And they are called Judaizers. Now, and that was one of the key things that we discussed during this book. Now, the Judaizers were a group of Jews that did what? Mm -hmm. Amen. Mixing law and grace. They brought in, uh, to reintroduce the Gentiles to circumcision. Uh, we're going to find in this text that Paul also is going to mention months and days and, and those type things. You know, there's a, some, some sort of a movement uh, today, you know. Uh, called the Hebrew Roots Movement in the body of Christ, where uh, a lot of people beginning to teach that, you know, we need to go back and keep the feast days. Well, we're not, no, no, we're not, we don't have to go and keep the feast days. We can learn from them. But, you know, we don't have to keep them, as some are teaching. And a lot of people are teaching that now. So uh, a, lot, a lot of people, Judaizers, they're believers. They believe you have to worship on Saturday Sabbath. And... Um, and so those things really bring us back on the bondage because when people get caught up on adding works with grace, they begin to magnify the works more than the grace of God. And so they'll begin to say, well, if you don't worship on Saturday Sabbath, you're not a Christian. And, and uh, matter of fact, um, one part, one section of the Seventh-day Adventists actually believe that uh, Saturday Sabbath worship, uh, that the, we Sunday worshipers, they call us, are uh, actually practicing the mark of the beast. They call that Sunday worship, you know. And so they're believers. That's our brothers. But they're, that's the type of, uh, that type of influence, what we would call Judaizers, where they're mixing something in that the Bible doesn't require us to do. Major challenge for Paul in this book. He has this challenge in more than Galatians. It's in, uh, he uh, fights against it, not called by that name in the book of Hebrews, where people are being pressed to go back under um, uh, the sacrificial system, you know. Well, who's introducing that? Deceived believers. And so we have to be on guard, uh, you and I, at all times. You know, we don't go back to um, things that brought us bondage. And we talked about Judaizers in the church today as being Christians who want you to 
do, do what is uh, in relation to your dress. Well, how do they want you to dress? Uh, they'll be saying you're not a, you know, you got to wear certain attire if you're a Christian, you know, that type thing. They're believers, but they're Judaizers in that respect. We love them. They are brothers and sisters, but it brings people in bondage, doesn't it? Amen? So tonight, we're going to look in uh, a certain issue. This is probably one of my favorite sections in Scripture we'll go across tonight. And concerning that um, influence of uh, or a contrast that the Apostle Paul makes tonight uh, concerning the child versus the heir, or I would say law versus grace, but what is a child in the, in the res respect that he's writing this, and what is an heir? And we'll find that we're both as believers. And so in Galatians 4.1, uh, let's read actually verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through um, 7. Let's begin to read there. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differing nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God had sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ Jesus. What an amazing text of scripture, isn't it? Now, what is Paul talking about here? The contrast between the child and the heir. Now, Paul is talking to, to a group of Jews um, who were under the law prior to salvation or prior to Jesus coming. They were under the law. Um, some say he refers to that as sort of a spiritually immature state for the nation. You know, they saw things in terms of what they did to keep the law, to obey uh, the commandments and the ordinances. And as such, they were ill-prepared for when Jesus came, who really came to fulfill it. Now we have a group of believers who are uh, saved, redeemed, experiencing it, um, tempted to go back under the law through false teaching. Notice what Paul says. Now, you and I are heirs, aren't we? Ro Romans 8 says we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. What's an heir? Amen. Hmm? Amen. One who is due to receive an inheritance, isn't it? In other words, if... Um, you, you or I, you know, you, you built your estate, you know, in insurance. I'm um, still licensed to sell insurance. And one of the things that, um, one of the titles of insurance is we call it an instant estate builder. Amen. So that you can leave an inheritance financially for those that are behind. In other words, there's something that you inherit that someone leaves you. That means you're an heir. Now, Jesus paid the price for us. But we are heirs of God. There's other things we receive as a benefit of heirship. And we'll see a little bit of this tonight. But notice Paul is going to make a contrast between the heir and um, the servant. He says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, you know, um, different nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now, in this uh, context, a child versus an heir, um, an heir here, if they're a child, Notice what he says, differs nothing from a servant. Now that word servant in the Greek is the word doulos. It means slave, a bond slave. It means that they're a slave, even though they may be Lord of all. Talking about an heir, but it's under tutors. This is why they're, they're called in this sense that, but it's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Now, in this uh, culture, um, you could be a heir, but you will be a sand or tutor to govern or steer or guide your life. And you, even though you were the um, inheritor of everything that your, uh, your family would leave you when they went on, you were still treated as a servant and you were taught and you were instructed until you reached a point of, um, I'll say accountability or where you were reckoned to be a man or you came into the, the place of accountability for your inheritance. 
Now, with the Jews, it's age 12 then. You know, actually, if you're a Jew, you go through a process when you become um, 12, whether you're a boy or a girl. I think the girl's called bat mispa, and the girls and the guys bar mispa. Well, at the age of 12, you transition from being an, a child to an adult. Now, you say, yeah, but they're only 12. I have to say this. Our concept of um, responsibility has fallen so low that that's almost beyond that. Our, our, we can't even grasp that, can we? That you can be 12 and be responsible for what you do from that point on. But that's, not the way, that's how it is in a lot of cultures. We grew up in a time, going back to the past a little bit, where we had to acquire a sense of responsibility much younger than children do now. You know, we were expected to carry our end of the bargain. You know, if we worked in the summer, we contributed to the household. Isn't that right? We gave to the household. You know, you, you got what you earned and you gave mama money. <laughs> Amen? We did that, didn't it? We be, we, they, they expected us after we began to work. Well, actually, before we even went to school, sometimes we were working world. Huh? Yeah, we were given chores. If you grew up in a country like we did, you know, where uh, you're somewhat of a farm setting, you had hogs, you had to slop the hogs. You're six, seven, but you make sure those hogs are fed before you got on the bus. That's true, isn't it? In other words, you acquire responsibility. I remember when I was about nine, um, I faked sick one morning. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, I did it too. <laughs> Anybody else ever do that other than we too? I faked sick. I was coughing, rubbing my eyes, trying to make myself look red, and, and, and my eyes red, and, and they asked what was wrong. I said, I don't feel good. Well, as soon as the bus came, felt better. And this farmer named Jasper came back. He wanted Daddy to help him. And he said, well, I'm a little busy right now, but, you know, JB, that's my nickname. He said, he, he'll go. That man took me in the field and he worked me. <laughs> and they knew what they were doing. That was the last time I faked being sick. <laughs> but by the time we were 12, we were, you know, we were working the summer, bound clothes, bound shoes. Amen. I saw one hand go like that. You know, we were learning responsibility, wasn't it? We were making a transition, yeah. At, at our household, it was certainly her, and it was not no boy who served God. Everybody had a job. Amen. I remember getting up and making sure the fire was going. You know, first it was, the, first it was my older brother, but then, you know, after they left, it passed down to us. So we had to get up in the morning and get the fire going. See, a lot of y'all that grew up with a lot of amenities, y'all don't know what that's like. Wood heater, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> huh? Pump water, yeah. Yeah, you know how water the faucet. But you learned responsibility, didn't you? So at an early age, you could actually do, do, do things to care for yourself. Now, in these cultures, they would make that transition around what we call puberty now. And they would make that transmission. So if you were a Jew, you took on responsibility at age 12. You know, from the point you were bar misfit, you know, you were making adult decisions. You bore responsibility. Now, in the Greek greco roman culture that Paul's addressing, it was a little different because at, with the Jew, it was a fixed time. Amen. Now, I'm going somewhere with this because this ties in to what we're looking at here. He said that the heir, as long as he is a child, differed nothing from a servant. In other words, that could be the heir. He could be the daddy, the boss's son, but he had to get out and labor and do just like the rest and have slaves teach him. In other words, they were accountable to be tutored and governed by others. Notice verse 2 says, until the time appointed, not by feast, not by uh, age, but by the father. Now, Paul's beginning to make a spiritual tie in there, amen, because it was the father in that Greco-Roman society that determined when that child would make the transition from being a child to an adult. And that's how he contrasts the law and grace, you know, between, you know, the law was given, as we saw in the preceding chapter, to be our schoolmaster, wasn't it? Our tutor to bring us to Christ. Well, once you're in Christ, amen, the, you know, you have the law written in your heart, not in tables of stone, but 
on the tables of our hearts, don't we? By the Spirit of God. And so there's a transition that comes. But here he says, is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So in the Greco-Roman house, it would be the Father that, that would determine it could be as early as nine. Yeah, that child is pretty mature. Let's move them into what their heirship determines that, that they receive. And so the father would determine that time that they would transition. In the Roman sense, at that transition, they would be given like a, a little, um, we might have seen them in, in movies where the, the younger children are wearing these tunics. Well, that would symbolize they made that transition. The father has appointed that they've moved to a place where they can receive a certain level of responsibility. Now that child is not simply being a servant, as we'll see later. They're beginning to step into their inheritance as a child of their father. That's us. And, um, and so, but we've got to learn to walk in it. And so until then, you know, we're under tutors and governors, or the Jews were until that time came. Now, the Jews determined, we said, at age 12, right? In the Greco-Roman situation, it was determined by the father based on their ability to handle responsibility. We also said a moment ago that the law served as our tutor, didn't we? Now notice he said, until the time appointed. The time appointed, he's talking about the father, but he's actually talking a deeper meaning to the time appointed by the father. Let's notice verse 3 first. Even so, while we are waiting that time that the father would appoint, we were children under bondage, under the elements of the world. That was a Jew under the law, and to a certain extent, all of us, amen. Now, we don't need to walk under that bondage of the world, but he is talking in this context of a time appointed of the father when that child can transition into true heirship, and it's not just a law thing. This is a grace thing by which we are saved. Notice the next verse. But when the fullness of time was come, um, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under law. One of my favorite Christmas spirit, uh, scriptures, as it were. But he's talking this in context of that transition from being under the elements of this world, under the law, to the fullness of grace. And he's talking to a people who are being taken from grace, going back under the bonds and restrictions of the law. Now, the time appointed of the Father, when, when it relates to our salvation, is when Jesus came. Now, there are certain key elements in that timing. Amen. So I guess if it, while I was reading this, I said, well, what time? You know, until the times of point of the Father. What time? What times came to uh, manifest that made it the time for Jesus to come? Now, there's a spiritual side to that, you know, um, because God would send forth his son. What's coming after that? Made of a woman. Made under the law. In the fullness of time. There are certain things God is a master planner. As crazy as the world looks right now, nothing's happening that is uh, causing God to, you know, get a little bit out of shape and go, man, <laughs> this thing, I need a plan B. No, 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 God has his plan. Amen. Now, our job is to learn to trust him even when we don't understand it. Amen. A lot of things, if I were God, would happen differently in the world. Amen. But uh, he's God. I'm not. Neither are you. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Now, when the fullness of time, somebody said fullness of time. What fullness of time is he talking about? See, God was setting up, setting the stage, as it were, from before, not when Adam fell. Not when he created the earth, but from the foundation of the world, God knew that there would be a certain time where he would break out of eternity into our history for the sole purpose of redeeming his creation that, that he knew would fall. So from the foundation of the world, Jesus is a lamb that was slain. Now, I don't quite understand the hows of why God did what he did, knowing that we would blow it. And then he'd have to become one of us to save us, but he chose in his wisdom to do that. That's one of the questions I ask when I get there. 
Lord, why did you choose to do it the way that you did? And, uh, and uh, because that, that kind of puzzles me. Y'all don't ever think about stuff like that. He, yeah, he knew we were going to blow it. But he still made um, this creation and put man in charge of it, knowing that he would have to die in our place in order to save it and us. You know, um, we'll be learning about these things throughout our eternity. The great love of God. He desires someone like him to, for fellowship. That he went through all of this to give us an opportunity to become an heir of his. See, we take our salvation too lightly. Amen. It's not accidental. God knew it from the time he, that, that when, the, when Father, Son, and Holy Spirit decided, hey, you know, God the administrator, we're going to do this. Jesus, I'll speak the word. The Holy Ghost, I'll manifest what you say. The three in one, they knew that that day would come where the second person in the Godhead, the creator, would die to save all his creation. Now, that just boggles my mind. This is what we um, begin, the, when, when we begin to look into Christmas, beyond all the, the trinkets and the decorations, you know, you know, Christmas really is when the God of heaven invaded earth on a rescue mission, seeking to save those that he made that forsook him, knowing, knowing that when he came, it would cost him everything he had, even his life, to give us the opportunity if we so choose. He won't make us. As many as received him, to them gave he the power to become sons of God. Wow. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you get in mind going to believe is how Jesus left the comfort of the world. Amen. And remember the time it says he was rich for your sake. Though he was rich, he became poor for our sake. I had a little vision. I shared that a few years ago in a message where it was like a flash across um, my, I say my mind's eye, you know, in a sense, where it was almost like you're standing on a precipice and and the heavenly host was around, and only like you know, the, the back of, you know, the Lord. And then all of a sudden, from heaven's side, you know, what would that look like? Because all of a sudden, the second person of Godhead, gone. And then now he's in a womb of a mere human for nine months. You know, have we ever thought about that from heaven's perspective? That the one that they were singing and praising and giving glory and honor to, all of a sudden for a brief space in time, he's not there. He's laid aside his heavenly prerogative. He's not operating as the son of God, but as the son of man without sin. He said at one point, how I am straightened till this baptism be accomplished. You know, he experienced all that we experienced, you know, all our limitations. Knowing he was God, he chose not to walk in it. Man, the miracle of what we call that kenosis, that, you know, Jesus was perfect man, perfect God. Amen. He was the God man. But he didn't function on earth as the son of God, but as the son of Adam without sin. That's why he had to be anointed with the Holy Spirit when he was on earth. So he limited himself. That word straightened means he limited himself. And that's why he hungered like we. Imagine the God that made earth, made the water, thirsting for water water. See, see we, we just read through scripture. We don't stop to think about stuff like that. It'll give you a much greater appreciation of it. He made everything we eat, but he hungered as a human and resisted the temptation when the devil said, if you be the son of God, Command these stones be made bread. I know you can do it. The Bible says all the morning stars shouted for joy at creation. Well, Satan was made at that point. I think it's Job. When it's, it's in the book of Job when you read it. Um, but, um, you know, and so, but now he's limited himself. Wow. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. And, um, so God determined, now's the time. There were certain spiritual things that had to be set in place. There were certain natural things that had to be set in place. 
The time of Jesus' birth was not an accident. Actually, when you read Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, you know, he prophesied that concerning the 69 and the 70 week prophecy, that after 69 weeks he would be cut off, not for himself. Even his death, Jesus fulfilled those prophecies to the day when he was birthed on earth. And um, for a specific reason, to offer us that opportunity to become an heir. And, but notice here, I don't want to get too far off, but when you start thinking about those things, man, <laughs> it's something else. Um, now, we're going to come back to Galatians 4.4. 4. Some people, when they read this uh, uh, text of Scripture, verses 1 and 2, also uh, you glean that from that, this thing called an age of accountability. We've all heard of that, haven't we? Now, is that biblical or not? You know, um, you know, because we tend to think, you know, babies, they go to heaven, don't they? Well, what's our scriptural basis for it? Because in, when you begin to study this, some people say, well, we kind of get that concept of an age of accountability. It does come from the Bible. Now, if somebody were to say, uh-huh. Yeah, that begins in 2 Samuel chapter 9, uh, 12, verses 15 to 23. Uh, that's one of the first indications. See, we, we need to have an apologetic for that because if somebody were to say, well, what happens to little babies when they die? What happens to all the aborted babies? You know, um, what happens to all the children that die in their, in their young age through no fault of their own? You know, uh, they lost. If somebody asked you that, what could you tell them? Now, I know that's a little sad trip, but from these texts, people will actually teach there is an age of accountability, but we need some meat on that bone, too. Now, 2 Samuel chapter 12, David did address that. Now, he had a son by adultery with Bathsheba, didn't he? And, and Nathan the prophet came and said, yeah, you know, God is going to, he's going to keep, you're going to be, you, you're going to be all right, but this child is going to die in essence. And what did David do? The child was born and the child fell sick. And King David prayed and prayed and fasted, and, um, but the child died. And the servants were afraid that David would be angry if they told him, but he noticed their behavior was different. And so finally he asked, you know, about the child. Is the child living or is the child dead? He said, a child is dead. And David stopped fasting right then, cleaned himself up and said, bring me bread. And he ate. And then they quizzed him and he said, well, when the child was living, you did all this. And because normally they would really make a big tumult when, especially a young child, passed like that. But you clean yourself up and you eat. He said, look, while the child lived, I hope that by my actions God will grant grace and the child would live. But the child died. I can't, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. So we know then that the child was with the Lord when, he, when that child passed. Well, that's one of the indications that yeah, it's there. Um, now, in Romans chapter 7, Paul alluded to something as well. Y'all always know we're taking a little sad journey here. We need to, because there are other things we can glean from this while we're at it. Paul makes a statement here, making, talking about the law. Verse 7, he says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known Lust, except the law said, thou shalt not covet, but sin. Somebody said, but sin. Taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of compulsions. Compulsions. <laughs> For without the law, sin was dead. Notice verse 9. <clears throat> he says, For I was, I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. That's another one of those scriptures we say there was a point in stage in innocence, a child, you know, they're alive, you know, unto God. But when they get an awareness of right and wrong, what's sin, you know, then they come under because now they're responsible for their actions. So it does seem there's a space in time. Now, we don't know exactly when. We said 12. That's, what they, that's why we got baptized at 12. Uh, that's why people said generally 12 is the age of uh, um, accountability. We don't know. That's in the father's purview. Because some people, children, mature earlier than others. So we can say, yeah, we believe that there is this place of innocence that a child is in. But when they become alive to 
Uh, but when the commandment came, sin revised or came alive and they die. When they know what's right and wrong, we don't know exactly when that is. That could be four. It could be ten. It depends on the child and what they're exposed to, I believe. So, but I do believe that children who are uh, young and, and uh, in their innocence when they pass, they, go to, they do go to be with the Lord. We do have a, some insight in Scripture for that. And with that, we can comfort people. When they go, man, I don't know about little baby. You'll see your baby again if you're saved. Uh-huh. Uh huh. He was adamant that if you did not baptize the baby by the age eight days old and that baby died, he was going to hell. He told a couple of us. They had just lost wow. the baby. He had literally told a couple of us. And all of us were just at odds that you would say something. And this was a believer. Yes, he was a believer. A Judaizer. <laughs> a believer that was still bound by law. Right. Versus reading the Bible to back up what you already do. Say that again. I like that. He said, oh, well, he told us to start reading the Bible. There were two things he was adamant about. First, keep things in context. Because mm-hmm. if you don't, you you're going to get off. You'll, you'll teach the scripture wrong. Second, he said, stop reading the Bible to back up what you already believe. But re- read the Bible through the power of the Holy Spirit to find out what to believe. Because the Holy Spirit is the author. Amen. Read to find out what to believe. And see, that's what Judea, the Judaizers would do. And it would bring people on the bondage. Now, um, that one would say eight days baptized. Um, I know of, um, um, well, I, don't, I hadn't seen him in 30 years, but a um, guy got saved in the hospital. And he's going to stand in a room and tell him that unless he can go get baptized, he was on his deathbed. Deathbed conversion. Told the man if he didn't get baptized, he would still go to hell. But it's the same spirit. A believer who believes wrong because they're adhering to certain things that they've taken on a con- out of context in the word. That's what the Judaizers were doing. They couldn't see that transition from law to grace. You've got to get circumcised. You've got to keep the Saturday Sabbath. You've got to keep the feast in order to be a true Christian. And so they had a council in Acts 15 in Jerusalem to settle the issue. And they gave them the base requirements. You know, don't eat what's been uh, sacrificed to idols, amen, but this other stuff, we'll lay no other commandment on you. You know, and so um, sometimes in our will meaning, we can bring people under bondage. But they are stronger in that belief, like this gentleman was, in what was wrong without a scripture because he had been taught that and wouldn't let it go. I think we all have seen people that way. You know, it can be uh, the, the, what day to worship, whether you're baptized, whose name you're baptized in, and they're adamant about it, and they'll go to bet, go to almost to blows with you over that, and they'll be a fellow Christian. It's bondage. And so same thing he's dealing with here. But thank God. Uh, Let's go back to verse 4. When the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son. Amen. Now, there are certain things that were being set in place in the world, as it were, too, for that fullness of time to really work the way that God wanted to. There was a time set when Jesus would come. God's began to set the stage from the foundation of the world, the lamb slain. Um, That's why in Genesis 3.15, it said the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. Well, that's part of setting the stage. God is saying then, when the time is right, the one who will come to redeem fallen man would be the seed of woman, so they would be human. Amen? But he was also saying in that that they would be human, man, without sin, because no man was involved in the conception. So the virgin birth, Genesis 3, 15 on, setting the stage for when the fullness of time. 
God initiated the covenants. He called out Abraham. He entered into the covenant. He set patterns with the feast. That's what the feasts were. They are rehearsals. They point to Jesus. Amen? You know, uh, the, one of the patterns was Passover. When I see the blood, I'll pass over you. God is setting the stage. The stage. And so when God approaches Abraham and Abraham is willing to offer his son, he says, because you have done this, legally now God can offer his son. Set in the stage for when the fullness of time would come, God could legally send his son into the earth. Legally. In such a way that the enemy could not argue against it. And so God set the stage through the law and the prophets. Amen. They all were pointing to Jesus Christ. The prophecies pointed toward Jesus Christ, where he would be born, set in the stage. Well, uh, behold, I'll give you a sign, a virgin shall conceive. Once again, reiterating, in a sense, Genesis 3.15, set in the stage. Uh, uh, getting certain things in place as far as even the cities that were there. You know, when Jesus was born, what nation, what nation was in charge of most, most of the known world? Rome. What did Rome bring to the world? Well, if he was going to be nailed to a tree, one of the things, ways they punished was crucifixion. Well, that was prefigured in Psalm 16 and Psalms 22. See, there are certain things that had to be in place that were mentioned in the Old Testament to set the stage for what God had. God set the pattern, too, with the serpents in the wilderness, didn't it? He put the serpent on a pole. Moses said in John chapter 3, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up. So a means of punishment for wrongdoers had to be set in place. That was primarily Rome, wasn't it? Rome also brought a system of roads and, and transport that the world did not know in the way that it did. Matter of fact, some of the Roman roads are still being used today. Isn't that right, Brother Moon? Amen. 2,000 years later, some of those roads are still used. They're aqueducts for transporting water. Some of those are still used today. See, that was part. Uh, why? Because they will use those roads later as a means to preach the gospel. But the government was set in place. You know, um, a language was set in place that, uh, uh, in, for the time of Jesus' coming. Koine Greek. The common everyday Greek. Um, everybody didn't speak Hebrew, but pretty much everybody spoke that Greek. Jesus spoke Koine Greek, didn't he? Amen. So, so there's a language. There's a culture. Um, there's the, the spiritual things God is setting in place. There had to be somebody that could believe what God said. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. See, I want to, one of the things we're trying to, I'm trying to stress this year, we need to look at, see, we can get so tradition laden when it comes to celebrating the Lord's birth that we'll just stick with, you know, the traditional scriptures. And that's one of the things that we're trying to get us out of this year so we can get a great appreciation for this. Now, in the book of Luke, verse 26, talking about in the fullness of time. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin. Amen. Now, somebody said, well, that could just be anybody, could it? What was unique about Mary? No, she's not the mother of God. Amen. She was of the household in the lineage of David. That was a requirement. The distinguishing characteristic of her to me, however, she was a woman of faith. Every woman, every virgin didn't have that kind of faith. Her faith is like Abraham's. Hmm. What do you mean her faith was like Abraham? How was her faith like Abraham's? She just believed God. Amen. And without sin, I mean, you know, now the, the angel comes to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary or Miriam. An angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Well, she was favored because she had faith. Amen. And she wondered about this salutation 
Amen. Verse 30, the angel again says, Thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the kingdom, over his kingdom, and, and there shall be no end. What did Mary say next? Let's read this together. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? Did Mary say it was impossible? No, she said, how is this going to happen? I, I don't know a man. I'm a virgin. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she had also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing. That word nothing is no rainbow. No spoken word shall be impossible. Let's read what Mary said next. Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, and the angel departed. Now, God sent an angel, a same angel, to another man named Zacharias. Told him about a son. He asked for a son. He said, I'm going to give you a son. You'll be dumb and won't be able to speak until this child is born. See, he didn't respond in faith to what, what the angel came. This woman did. Be it unto me according to thy word. Now, why do we say she had faith like Abraham? Mary arose, verse 39, and went into the hill country and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. And she spake out with a loud voice, saying, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? Oh, she's full of faith, too. That's powerful, isn't it? For as low as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her of the Lord. Now, what does Mary have to go on so far? What well, the angel told her. Amen. Now let's see what Mary says. Amen. Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. See, the, see, Mary, you know, that means she had to be in a household of faith. They had to teach her the law. They had to teach her to believe and trust God. Amen. You know, and, and so when the angel comes, she responds, be it unto me according to what you say. Amen. At that point, the word becomes flesh. Now, when you're first impregnated, you don't know, you don't feel. Notice what she says. Verse 47, my spirit had rejoiced in God my Savior, for he had, past tense, regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he that is mighty is going to do great things. Wait a minute, he's not going to do it? See, this is faith talk. Had done it. Well, what saying does she have? The word. Amen. The word the angel told her. Her belly didn't just start going out. Sailor. See, let's pause. Let's think about this. He had done great things, and holy is his name. Well, she's talking in past tense. That's faith. Yeah. Verse 51, he had showed great strength. 52, he had put down the mighty. 53, he had filled the hungry with good things. 54, he had hope in his servant Israel. This woman full of faith. And so in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son made of a woman, a woman that would believe without proof that she could feel in the fullness of time. So that means that part of the plan hinged on the right woman being in place. Amen. A woman that would believe what the angel told her. A woman with faith, like faith for Abraham. Amen. And so that's part of the fullness of time. What else goes on here? In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son through the virgin Mary. The word becomes flesh. And um, at the same time, there has to be a level of commitment and dedication to serve God because in that culture, this was a scandal. Hmm? Punishable by death, yeah. Joseph considered a way to put her away privately because 
He didn't want any harm to come to her. The penalty was death for being pregnant out of wedlock. They had stone heaps in Israel because of that. And yet he decided to cover. Joseph was a remarkable man too. Both of them of the house and the lineage of David. Amen. Part of the fullness of times was a government in power. I talked about Rome earlier. They had the power to tax the known world because they had to go forth a decree. How are they going to get back to that place that was prophesied Bethlehem that went out a decree from Augustus Caesar that all the world would be taxed? And they had to go back to the place of their lineage, their, their home, Bethlehem. That actually traces back to the book of Ruth that we'll look at on Sunday. Amen. And so we see all these things God has set in place. God is amazing. Amen. He just wove all these things through time and history to get to the right place, the right time, the right king in place, the right people in place, the right woman in place, the right man who would cover a woman in that situation. Uh, no man wants to take care of somebody else's baby. But then if, you, if she come to you and say, man, an angel of the Lord. No, nah, that one, no angel you saw, girl, that one. See, that's how we do in the 20, 21st century. Amen. So imagine the faith of Joseph. We cut Joseph. We want to give Joseph credit like we ought to. He had to be a man of such integrity that the God of creation could entrust himself to be cared for by this man on earth. See, we overlook Joseph. In most major scenes, he's a prop. He's just standing there, but he is the covering. Amen? So Joseph is an amazing man, too. So these two people, fitted and prepared by, the God, by God over the course of time, so that when the angelic pronouncement came, one would hear from the angel and stay with her and bear the shame, and the other would heed the word and say, Be it done unto me according to your word and bear the shame. See, we don't generally think about how their life might have been at that point. The scandal. Psalm 69 does talk about it. Amen. You know, about those early years of Jesus. You'll find that in there. And so we, we, we don't see all of that. But this, all this happened in the fullness of time, when the time was right. God worked to get to this point. Um, that she was made of a woman, made under the law. What does that mean? See, we just read through this stuff, don't we? Made of a woman. That's the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14, Genesis 3, 15. Made under the law. Amen. In other words, the law was holy. Uh, we see in Romans 7. The law is spiritual. We see in Romans, the seventh chapter. Amen. The law also brought bondage because it convicted us of sin. We couldn't keep it. So if he's made under the law, he also would be the one who could fulfill the law. Matthew 5, 17. He said, think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Oh, man, all that in the fullness of times. So Jesus came to fulfill the law. Amen. Another thing he did in being made under the law was that his lawful entry into earth. Go to John chapter 10, if you would. And so, in other words, everything God did is in accordance with, in, in such a means that no matter what the deceiver could say, he could not go against what God had done because God did it legally. Amen? Let's go to John chapter 10 real quick. Let's see. I'm, I'm having fun. John chapter 10. Made under the law. Well, you know, you got a bad, what's the lawful way to get on earth? Birth. Notice John 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. Well, what's the sheepfold? That's the earth. This is where we are, isn't it? We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now, if you come any other way, the same as a thief and a robber. What does that tell us about the devil? See, that's why John 10, 10 calls him the thief. The thief cometh but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He's illegal. Amen? 
And so he has no legal right to the earth. Well, he received dominion on earth from Adam when Adam rebelled against God. And now notice here, he that entered not by the door into the sheepfold, but clambered up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, but he that entered by the door. What's the door? It's the womb of woman. Um, the same is, is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus came lawfully into the earth. He didn't just say, well, I'm God. I'll just bust in any kind of way. Nope. The only way to have legal authority on planet earth is to be born of a woman. And then, now I taught years ago the authority of your body. Your body gives you a certain authority on the earth. The devil can't make you do anything except you yield your body. Amen. Spirits without bodies don't stay here. That's the only legal way to stay on earth. That's why when you die, you either go to be with the Lord or you go to hell. But you ain't staying here. That wasn't Aunt Annie that sat on your bed. That was a familiar spirit. <laughs> See, all this right here in John 10, the legal way. Now notice, to him the porter opened it, and the sheep hear his voice, and he called his own sheep by name, and he leaded them out. And when he put it forth his own sheep, he go up before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger they will not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Verse 7, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Jesus came the legal way through the door in order to become the door so man could get back to God. One way to have legal authority on earth, be born. One way to get to heaven, that's through the one who came through that door. Jesus. The demons questioned his authority. They sent people to him. By what authority do you do this? You read that. They didn't understand that Jesus had legal authority because he was fully man. And they gave him legal authority on the earth. And walking in that authority and fulfilling the law as a man qualified him legally to be the one to bear the penalty, God said to Adam, he pronounced a death sentence. Adam couldn't redeem himself. He was in sin. Oh, but Jesus, the sinless man, could become our sin offering. Let's go back to Galatians 4. Y'all learn anything? See, when we, we think about it, we see it. But, but we got to pause and think about it. Now, that means since the devil's an illegal spirit, illegal spirit in that respect, he, don't have the, he can't make you do anything. So what does he do to you? He makes an appeal to your flesh and to your man to entice you to yield this body to do his bidding. Flip wrist and lied to people for all them years. The devil made me do it. No. The devil could entice you to do it, but he can't make you. The devil can't come into your room, grab a, your hand, make you put it on a gun, and make somebody go out. You have to yield to a murderous spirit before somebody dies for by a gunshot. You have to yield your body. Your body, now you and I have a legal body endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. So now we have not just legal authority, we got power. See, we don't know who we are because we're sons. That's what Paul is coming to. All this right here in this one little book, when we begin to pull it out. Going back to Galatians 4, the third thing Made under the law, verse 5, note, to redeem them that were under the law. That was the Jew and the Gentile, amen. Uh, we might not have had the law and commandments, but there was a law in our hearts that we had to go by, amen. To redeem them that were under the law. Why? Why did he come? That we might receive the adoption of sons. In the fullness of time, God made that available. So this involves his birth his sinless life, thereby fulfilling the law, and then as that sin offering for you and I and on the cross. Amen? So that we might receive the adoption. Now, if we know anything about adoption in those days, the adopted person had more rights than the, legal, than the birth born because you chose that one in the Roman culture. So he came that we might receive the adoption of sons, didn't he? Amen? Anybody got a question? He came to redeem us. Now, what does redeem mean? He purchased us. With what price? His blood. Won't redeem with corruptible things such as silver and gold, but by the precious blood 
of Jesus. Amen? He paid the price for you and I so that we could become sons of God, a direct creation of God Almighty, the adoption of sons. Amen. Now, and so he's talking a little bit about sonship here, that we might receive the adoption of sons. What does that mean to you and I to be a son of God? Well, I don't know, Pastor. I'm a woman. Well, you're, you're also called the son of God. Well, I don't know about liking that. Well, you know, the Bible said I'm married to another, even Christ. You know, that's just the terminology. Amen. It denotes our relationship, doesn't it? We do have relationships with sons. Well, you, if you say sons and daughters, nobody has a problem with that. But the Bible calls us all. It's a beloved now. Ye are the sons of God. Amen. Now, now, sonship means that there's an inheritance involved from the father. It also means there are certain benefits of sonship that we need to look into as believers. Amen. Because there are benefits. But notice he says that we might receive the adoption. He said might receive it. One of the beautiful things about um, salvation for us is that God wants us to be saved, but he don't make you. John 1, 12 says, as many as received him. So we need to receive the Savior, don't we? To them gave he the power or the right or privilege to become the sons of God, even unto them that believe on his name. So what qualifies us is faith, belief in his name. Well, his name is Savior, isn't it? And so... The good news for us is that once we believe, we receive the right to become a son or daughter of God because of what we believe. Now, as a son, there are certain privileges I'm due. Now, if I'm an heir in my father's house, what do you inherit it? Because you're the son or daughter of somebody. You get a name, don't you? Now, the Bible says a good name is to be head above riches. Yeah, we get the greatest name of all. See, now, but, but my family, yeah, my, my, my people, well, you're in a new family. See, if we get the revelation of whose family we're now in, that'll supersede all, well, I grew up on the wrong side of the track. You were born again on the right side. <laughs> See, we have to think like Christians, don't we? Yeah, but everybody in my family got evil temples. Well, you got a new spirit in you. The Bible says he'll choose my inheritance for me. See, if we begin to think like sons, he gave us the right, the privilege to become sons of God. And so I inherited a name. He gave me the name of Jesus. That's the name that is above. His name is above every name that is named. And we are named after him. Paul says in Ephesians, the whole family in heaven and earth is called after his name. Ooh, we inherited a name. I got a minute. Think about that. We received a name. We also, when we got saved, received a destiny, didn't we? Amen? We're beneficiaries of what he died to get for us. Amen? So we have a destination. He gave us a new life, gave us a new purpose. But we are named after the name of Christ. We're called Christians, aren't we? Now, I'm going to meddle for a second. The second commandment says what? That thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Have we ever thought about what that means? See, we think it's cussing. It's more than just cussing. If I'm named after the name of Jesus, behavior that... Some of y'all starting to see what I'm saying, don't you? That, that is not like a Christian is taking his name in vain too. See, we just think in terms of somebody seeing the GD word. No, if you're a Christian living like hell, amen, you're taking his name in vain. People going, I thought you were a Christian. See, that brought ill repute to the name of the one that redeemed us. So taking the Lord's name in vain is deeper than just what you say, it comes down to how we live because we're ambassadors. 
See, some of us never, never thought about that before, have you? So if I'm a Christian living like the world, and people say, man, if that's a Christian, I don't want to be one. We're taking his name in vain. Have we ever? We hadn't thought about that, had it? But think about it. Because having his name demands that we live up to that name to bring honor to it. Just like if somebody will, you know, you're, you're a Burke, you're a Welch, you're a Moon. You know, you, you don't, you know, people in your family don't act like that. See, certain people's names carry that, don't it? Well, if you act opposite a name, they rebuke you on it, won't it? Same thing with his name. You know, is my behavior glorifying God? If not, I'm taking his name in vain. Taking the Lord for granted. Amen? Wow. Everybody need to hear this. Because too often in the church world, we take the Lord's name in vain because we think it's just you using bad words all the time. Hmm. It's behavior inconsistent with the testimony of the name we bear. Wow. Amen. Amen. That's something to think about, isn't it? Because we're sons, we need to honor the name of the one that saved us. We've received the adoption of sons. Notice verse 6. And because you are sons, God had sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba. That's a term of intimacy, isn't it? Abba, Father. So not only, you see, I, I got to stop identifying after the world. I'm a son. Now, Abba means daddy. Amen. I don't have a father. Yeah, I do. Amen. See, if we can get people off the natural family, if they didn't have a good one and get them to realize, now you're in this forever family. I didn't have a father. You got one now. Amen. And he's a friend to the fathers. Amen. And he's made you one of his and he's for you and he'll never leave you. Yeah. But in the world, you're not in the world anymore. You're in, you're in Christ. You're in the kingdom. Amen. Now notice here, the spirit of his son is in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Because of that, wherefore, thou art no more a servant. We serve God, not because we're servants. Amen. We serve him because we love him. That makes us a doulos, a true doulos, bond slave. In the Old Testament, you know, a bond slave was one who, um, anybody want to take a stab at that before I do? I know some of y'all know. You know, when you read in the Old Testament about someone who had an opportunity to be set at liberty, and they said it, I, 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 uh-huh. Bond slave is someone that willingly dedicates the rest of his life. He's no free man. He serves his master. And in doing so, he is taken to the doorpost and a solid gold ring is put in his Amen. And actually the scripture says that they take an awl and drive that into their ear. And you're bound to this house for your life. That's the terminology. We bind ourselves to Jesus for our life. We're bond servants. Even though we're sons, we choose willingly to serve him with our life. Amen? So for us, we have to get rid of um, um, the bad mentality that the word slave would have. Because here, this is a good word. And so even though we're sons, he's not looking at us as servants, but sons. And if a son, then an heir. But we're willful servants by choice. We're sons who choose. We're not rebellious sons. We're not sons that go out and blow the inheritance. We're sons that say, I'm abandoning myself to you for life by my choice. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Man, what a blessed place to be. So we're the ones who have chosen. Amen? And the Apostle Paul often considered himself the same way. I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. He exalted the fact that he was a servant, though he was a son. Amen? 
Hallelujah. Now that means if I'm a bond slave to Jesus, then that means I don't have the right just to do whatever I want to do. Amen. Is what he wants me to do because I'm bound to honor him with my life. I'm bought with a price. Amen. And so I'm no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So uh, I have a name, I have an inheritance, and I have a destiny. Amen. And because I'm a son, I've got a father. Amen. Hallelujah. And so Paul is using this to rebuke the Judaizers. Amen. You're not a son by the law. You're a son through faith in Jesus. Notice verse 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, by which by nature are no gods. He said, this is where you were. But now, after that you have known God, or rather, now here's his, his rebuke to them, that now rather you've known God, or rather are known of God, I'll turn you again to weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. I've told you all that he's done in the fullness of time, dying for you, give you the right to the tree of life. You're a son, you're an heir, and you've got all these benefits. And he said, would you rather, now that you've known God, would you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, the law and all the ordinances and all the commandments that you could not keep, and where until you desire to be again in bondage? You observe days. See, this, he's telling him, you're going back. You observe days, you're bound up on the Sabbath. I had a question on that on Sunday concerning that. Now, this was after service. Someone asked me a question concerning that, you know, because someone was disputing with them concerning should a believer, you know, keep um, the Saturday Sabbath. And this is what Paul is talking about. You observe days, um, months, feasts, and times, and appointments or what feasts were, they were, uh, dedicated appointments, and years. You're going back to the weak and beggarly elements that could not save you. And you know what Paul says, the last part of this? I'm afraid for you. <laughs> Lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I don't even know if y'all caught where I'm teaching. That's what Paul is saying. It looks like I'm wasting my time with y'all. Remember, he called them bewitched one time, didn't he? <laughs> See, Paul was tough. I like that. But he's speaking out of love to him, isn't he? Man, y'all so caught up on going back to this old stuff. I don't know if it's worth my time messing with y'all. But he didn't stop. He said, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. He said, you ain't hurting me. See, Paul is laying it on them, isn't he? <laughs> God hates religion. One guy said, Jesus was the most irreligious person that ever walked. Because religion is you trying to get right with God, and you can't do it. And here's a people wanting to go back on the religious system that didn't work before Jesus came. And you're going back? That's like the dog returning to his own vomit. They do that too, don't they? He says, you know how that through the infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation was in my flesh, you despise not nor reject it, but receive me as an angel of God, even as Jesus Christ. And so he's continuing on with this theme here. Um, he said that through the infirmity of flesh, people try and say that, see there, Paul had eye disease. The Bible didn't say that. Infirmity don't mean eye disease. It simply means weakness. Through the weakness of my flesh, I'm preaching to you. What was Paul throwing? A messenger of Satan. Well, why do people say he had eye disease? See, tradition and the Bible are different. And <laughs> some say, say they said it because he, they, they say it here that um, verse 15, where is this blessedness you speak of? For I bear your record that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. See there, I told you it had a problem. No, that's a phrase of speech. Just like I corner you, we got a corner you, don't we? Well, that's called the apple of your eye. You know, it's not an apple. <laughs> yeah. See, what was that statement that, that you made earlier? You read the... In right. To find out what God says. Because the Bible says, there was given unto me because of the abundance of the revelations, 
a thorn in the flesh, the messenger, the word messenger is angelos, that means a demon. The messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure, and it buffeted him wherever he went. You know, Paul was in a lot of tight situations because that demon stirred up trouble wherever Paul went. Amen? But Paul had to learn to deal with it. When you read the last chapter of Acts, the Bible said Paul ministered, um, I think, for two years in his own house, no man forbidding him. That, you know, I think Paul dealt with that thorn. Amen. God said he had the grace to deal with. He said my grace is sufficient. Grace is ability things. Amen. He was praying that God do it. God's not going to do for us what God told us to do. Amen. But God get the devil off my back. No, the Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee. Amen? Whom resists, stay fast in the, flay, in the faith, the Bible tells us, doesn't it? Amen? So God's not going to do for you and I what God told us to do. We're in a different covenant. One of the major differences between the old covenant and the new, and I'm going to just add this in, is that God did for them in the old what they could not do for themselves. They didn't have the authority to deal with Satan, and so they didn't have to deal with him. God dealt with him. In the new, through the new birth, we have not just the authority but the power, and God tells us to deal with him. He never told the Old Testament saints, in my name cast out devils, but he did us. Amen? And so there's a different mentality for you and I as New Testament believers who are sons and daughters of God. Amen? We have the power and the responsibility to submit, resist, rebuke, drive out, amen, because we now have the power to do it as sons of God. And so God ain't going to do it for us. I got in trouble years ago as a new believer, I'm preaching a pulpit, going to devil's own, and I can't get him off. I shouted out, cast him out. Well, I got in trouble. That wasn't wise. But I was only like 19. You know, but we have to learn to control ourselves too, don't we? But we need to realize, as believers, you want to have power to cast Satan aside. That's us. Amen. And God expects us to walk in it because we're sons. He said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. You're cast out devils. Amen. Hallelujah. So our authority. We'll stop right here tonight. But... Um, I know we went a long way, amen, in the fullness of time, but all these things were available to us because Jesus came. Amen? We have the ability, you and I, beloved, to handle whatever Satan brings our way in Jesus' name. Not by our might, but by his might. That's why the Bible says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the armor. That's why 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5 tells us, amen, that even though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh, but the weapons of our warfare are what? Mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds. God's not going to pull down the strongholds in your mind. You got to do it. Casting down imaginations. Those are reasonings. You know, crazy thoughts come and park in your head. They don't have to stay there. You can drive them out because you're a son. And he gave you the right to become a, the power to become a son of God. And power is given us to cast those thoughts down in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm talking to somebody. Amen. Casting down imaginations and every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Our task is to get the correct knowledge of God so we know what thoughts are not of God. And what teachings are not of God. And what things we hear are not of God. And then we're to cast them down. Amen. And then he went on to say we need to have a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Amen. So we need to be ready to self-correct when we find ourselves wrong. Amen. We need to stop excusing our behavior. I'm human. No, I'm a child of God. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Let's stop right here. We'll pick up on Galatians 4. Um, verse 16. Uh, next go around and we'll finish that chapter. Because that allegory between, this is going to take all the next week. When you get, get to verse 21 uh, through the rest of the chapter, when he gives that 
difference between, oh man, Abraham and his two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, the son of the promise and the son of bondage. That right there will open up a lot of stuff for, that we'll see a lot of things that are happening in the world today based on that, those two sons. So we'll spend a little time there. He said those things are for an allegory, and we can use them for an illustration. They represent not just Ishmael and Isaac. They represent covenants. One is bondage and one is free, and we're in that freedom. Amen. So let's pick up on that next week. I, I trust y'all learned something. I got blessed. Amen. Praise God.